in November of 2018, a 17-year-old South Sudanese girl named Yalong went off the market. Her parents had auctioned her off to the highest bidder, a South Sudanese business tycoon who was much older than she. He had already had nine other wives. He had paid for Yalong's hand in marriage and for her freedom with 500 cattle and three V8 cars, totaling to about 35,000 US dollars. Now, when this happened, uh, I remembered viewing this and following this, this case and realizing that it was the first time that I had been able to follow a highly publicized uh, uh, proce marriage procedure from my culture online. And I remember following Yalong's case in despair and fatigue and wondering what could I possibly do about this? What could anyone do about this? Now, Yalong's case is not specific to her. In fact, virtually every Nuer South Sudanese woman that I grew up around um, was married off in this way. My mother was married off in this way, um, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. This institution of marriage, this Newer marriage, uh, these newer marriage practices have been going on for generations and generations and generations. It has persisted through many, uh, all different uh, geo, uh, political eras of Sudanese uh, society. It has persisted through Arab Anglo colonialism. It has persisted through uh, today's um, post colonial independent nation state that South Sudan is in. And it has even come to affect the way that we live our lives as immigrants in the Western world. Today, I want to break down this institution of marriage and explain exactly what keeps it going in this day and age. I also want to explore exactly how women in, these inst in this institution are able to self-actualize and become uh, independent women. So my name is Naimal Tour, and I am a South Sudanese, um, and I'm, I'm also a third year student here at Yale University, and I make documentaries uh, as a, a, a hobby. So my family originates from South Sudan. Um, sorry. My family originates from South Sudan, which is the world's newest country. It was created in 2011 after over half a century of grueling war against the northern uh, British Arab uh, colonizing regimes. And I want to specify that today I will be talking specifically about uh, Nuer tribal practices. So South Sudan has a number of uh, many, many different tribes, and the way that people conduct themselves uh, with regards to marriage differs. And I do not want this to be uh, a sort of generalization. Um, so specifically with um, marriage practices today, it will be about the Nuer. Now, if you've seen anything about South Sudan in the news, or followed any stories uh, online or on TV, you've probably seen an image that looks a lot like this. Uh, a field of many, many cattle with great big majestic horns. Um, sometimes there's a little South Sudanese boy who's tending to the cows. And this image is very prominent for my culture for uh, two specific reasons. For one, cattle represents a sort of uh, currency for my traditional economy. Secondly, cattle is the key to holding power. And those who are able to hold cattle are men, so power, men. Um, and so in traditional Nuer society, uh, meaning before colonialism and the introduction of like capitalism, uh, traditional Nuer society mostly operated under something called the cattle blood bond economy. And so this is basically an allocation of resources. It's an economy but it is a three-part economy that works to justify and um, perpetuate this tradition of marriage. Now, there are three parts to this economy, and the first, as you may have guessed, is cattle. And, um, and like I said before, cattle is a way to, to have power, and this power is used to organize society. It is used to form relationships and uh, to do so through marriage. So as I had uh, talked about with Nyilong's case, um, in order to be married, you have to be, as a woman, in order to be married, you have to be sort of bought for a bride price of cattle. And typically, the cattle ranges from 30 to 50 cattle, uh, totaling to about 250 US dollars each. And so um, cattle is the key to holding power, creating relationships. And it's important to create relationships because um, this leads us to the second part of the cattle blood bond economy, which is blood. 
And when I say blood, it seems like a scary, like dystopian, I don't know, sort of ritual, but it's not. Blood just means offspring. Blood just means creating more life. And this life and having children is absolutely crucial to Noor male identity because it is a way that Noor men are able to continue their legacy is a way that Noor men are able to um, pass on their life and existence through these children. Furthermore, it's extra beneficial if you have many daughters because um, then you can sell them off to create more, you know, to gain more cattle and to have more power. So this cattle blood bond economy uh, is a sort of insid insidious cyclical sort of system that perpetuates male power and really um, uh, to affirm male identity. Um, so the more cattle you have, the more of a man you are. Um, something interesting that I learned about in my research is that in traditional Noor um, society, it was considered a very shameful act for one to sell their cattle because it was as if you were selling a part of yourself. You uh, were selling a part of your agency and you were becoming less of a man. Um, so E. E. Evans Pritchard is a very famous early 20th century cultural anthropologist and he was the first anthropologist to study and document Noor society and Noor culture. He talks about this in relationship between cattle, uh, power, and men uh, by saying that the fundamental identity and oneness between cattle and men uh, comes from this relationship's ability, existential ability to transcend some of the most profound human frailties. And therefore, men are able to achieve a greater sense of mastery over their world, meaning um, death be can become surmountable. Infertility can become uh, reversible, and illness something that can be actively defined and um, cured. So in the face of these human frailties, when resources necessary to sustain a long human life are scarce, when, um, life dependency, or when life expectancy may seem short or may be cut short, the possession of cattle allows for the Noor man to extend his life through his children. So it's best to have as many children as possible. And if you have enough cattle, you can marry as many women as possible to have more children and to sort of live on and um, have a greater legacy. And in this system, women are really a, a means to achieve that. But what about the woman's livelihood in this, in this situation? Does a newer woman have the ability to find and exercise their personhood in this situation? How can she accomplish this when she's been taught that she has no space to do so in this system? Well, um, as I said before, I'm a film documentarian and last year I became really interested in learning exactly how this system works and why it still operates today. And um, I decided to use whatever power I had outside of the system in order to amplify the voices of the women around me who are currently in the system. And so what I did is I learned about this system and I, I thought about my own positionality in, with regards to um, this institution. So for example, um, and in my relationship to the system. So for example, um, I am a product of the system, but I won't have to, but I will never be a part of the system. Um, so you don't have to worry, like no South Sudanese American children are ever going to face this really um, because it's just not feasible here and it's not necessary here. Um, but I decided to make a film in order to create a space for the women in my life to speak out about uh, their situation and to speak for themselves uh, in a way that is safe and in an environment that um, is outside of just when they are with each other. So um, I created my documentary and I decided to share a little clip with you all today. And uh, just as a note, the video may seem a bit weird because I blacked out a part of the screen to make sure that um, these women's identities can remain anonymous and that they can remain safe. By himself, for everyone. For everybody. And, then and he can invite his friends, they can come eat over here. Mm -hmm. And they are, there is no charge for that. No charge? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Just like a family, they're eating for free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Every day they come for free.
house. Yeah. Oh my god. I know. They come, they're gonna say, oh, the lady is bad. She don't like people. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you are married, yeah. you are, your dad can't pay, can't pay to like do this. She don't have to cook very yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. He just go to work and come home. If he come home, just sleeping, he don't do nothing. Yeah, he just eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he waited for his wife. I can't believe I was thinking, uh, <laughs> and, 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 no one, no one, no one. If you do just a little bit of mistake, you're gonna you get work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. a little child. Mm -hmm. Money well done. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the women in my documentary uh, who actually commented on cows being wasted um, is my mother and she's here today. Um, <laughs> And as these women explained, um, once a woman is married off, uh, usually she's married off when her father decides uh, he wants to get more cattle. And this usually happens before she's able to graduate from high school. And if um, financial times are tough for the family, it could be as early as middle school. Um, so once married off, these women have to cook, clean, have as many children as possible. Um, and in the American context, also have to deal with working a full-time job. And because they don't have an education, working harsh jobs in factories, and also dealing with raising eight children in America. Um, and so through this documentary, I was able to learn a lot about my mother and her friends and how they conceptualize the world and how they, and how they deal with finding their own personhood um, in the face of two systems, the tribal and the Western uh, capitalist and, and racist system that places these women at the bottom of both ladders. So now that we have this information, a background about this institution, what could we do about this? What could anyone possibly do to ameliorate this? Well, the first thing is to learn and educate yourself on systems of power that are in your society, and also to locate your own relationship within that system, and to locate and to realize whatever powers you may have um, inside or inside of or outside of that system, and how you can use that power to help empower the women or the people who are most affected by a system. And what we need to do is think critically, not about how to save these women or how to save children or people who are uh, under a certain system, but how we can support and how we can uplift these women. And um, for specifically for us immigrant third world Nora children, that can be something as simple as helping your mom with ESL or um, helping tutor your mom with whatever college classes she wants to pursue. And this um, help can be more intimate. It can be more... Uh, personal and it can be more quiet but what is important is not speaking for these women but it is for again using your power to uplift them and for um, everyone else it is everyone's duty to continue to learn more about worlds um, greater than your own thank you Woo!